Posso com começar compartilhando a minha tela? Pode. Eu, antes, de qualquer forma, vou te apresentar, Sally, mas... Uhum. Okay. ok, so, welcome, everyone. This is the second edition of our Young Brag. And we will have today uh, two young uh, Brazilian mathematicians, well, not Brazilians, but working in Brazil, uh, discussing their, their research work. So the first one is Sally Andrea, who just got her PhD from... Ufi, and uh, she will talk about an explicit resolution of the Abel map via tropical geometry. Mm. Everybody can see my screen? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so thanks for the opportunity. And I know that the time is short and I like to speak a lot, so I try to be faster as I can. And uh, today I will talk about what I studied in my PhD. I have the pleasure to study with Marco Pacini and Alex Abreu. And um, let's start. So I will talk about the problem of construction of an explicit resolution of the Abel map for a family of curves. And I will try to explain these things better. So to start, uh, the Abel map appears in the 19th century in the work of Abel. And um, many people devoted time to study problems related to the Abel map and the Jacobian. But the Abel map of a uh, smooth curve C is the map which takes the D product of C, the cox of C, to the usual Jacobian that parameterize the invertible sheaves and take at the top of of points to the sheaf um, associated, uh, the sheaf uh, to the divisor that is the sum of these points. And this map is interesting because uh, the fibers are complete linear systems, uh, the images are the Brunet varieties, and these maps appear directly and discretely uh, every time we use uh, crypto systems with uh, elliptic curves. But uh, as I told you, I work with family of curves. Exactly um, one parameter family of smooth curves degenerating to another curve. So I have a uh, smooth total space C and uh, dimension one scheme B. And here um, we have a uh, smooth generic fiber and the singular fiber that is our nodal curve C. Um, to define the map for this case, we need to extend the, the Jacobian. So we need a compactification. There is some compactifications, but we choose to work with the Steve Jacobian. So we take a polarization of the Greek key over the family and a section through its smooth locus. And the Steve Jacobian is defined by the sigma mu quasi stable torsion free rank one sheaves on the fibers of the family, uh, quotient by some equivalent relation. And here, the quasi-stability uh, is a numerical condition that we will see uh, with more details in the case of graphs, because it's uh, essentially the same thing. So uh, the Abel map uh, for a family of curves uh, is given by, we take uh, invertible sheaf L, of the Greek key, and the the map now uh, go come to the product of C over B uh, to the Steve Jacobian, which take a couple of points in this uh, shift here. But this shift is not always torsion free, and even when it is invertible shift, uh, it cannot be a quasi stable. Actually, when we take nodes here of our nodal curve. Uh, uh, this is not a Cartier divisor, and we can even define the map this way. So the problem with this map is that this is just rational, and we want to find an explicit resolution. So uh, first, let's look around a uh, point uh, when we have this problem, uh, and exactly the worst point could be that is all the entries here are nodes of another curve. So let's look 
to the local ring of CD. So we take a family of curves and let's look around the point N with all the entries R nodes of our nodal curve. The completion of the local ring of CD in N is given by this quotient ring here. And the map CD in B is given by these equalities locally around N. But if we try to draw what has happened, I could draw this. So in the case of the degree two, the degree two Abel map, uh, and if we look to the point N, N1, N2, where N1 is the, the intersection of the component CJ and CH, and N2 is the intersection of the component CI and CL, we have this tangle of nodes and to untie it, we need to explode the things. But I can explode the things crazily. Uh, uh, in this case, exactly, uh, we have two ways to, to realize blow-ups here. Uh, but in general, just one help me to define, to extend the map. So we could explode uh, this visor here or this second one. So what we, we've done? We're mixing geometries. We have an algebraic geometry problem and we uh, go to the toric geometry because there we can relate uh, toric varieties. Um, we can see uh, blow ups in toric varieties related to subdivisions in cones and hypercubes. So uh, what we essentially do is look at this ring uh, and see the toric variety associated to this, this local ring. Um, and then we, we go to the tropical side and we look at the tropical lobe map and the tropical Jacobian and we find hypercubes there and subdivisions that we could relate with these subdivisions we did in the toric side. So, um, the toric side, I try to explain quickly, and essentially, in the case of the degree two that we saw, um, what I told that uh, we have two possible blow-ups here. The, the first one, it's the blow-up in Z1, Z2 complementary, and the second one, Z1, Z2. And what we do here is um, take these divisors and associate them with points with coordinates zero and one, or one. Uh, so we get an hypercube. In this case, we have I square. And uh, the possible triangulation of this hypercube, it will be related to these blow ups. So this is the possible triangulations, and we relate with the, the blow ups. So now let's go to the th uh, tropical side. We have to make a connection with uh, our family and the tropical curves. And we do this uh, through the dual graph. So for example, for this curve, the banana curve, we associated this curve with this dual graph. Here we have two components that will be the vertices. So we relate uh, components with vertices and nodes with edges. And here, one edge connected to vertices. If this edge are related to the node that, that is the intersection of the components related to these vertices. And if we look uh, at some smooth point in some component, this point appears exactly in the vertex related to the, the component. So now to understand the tropical Jacobian and the tropical logo map, we need uh, to make a way to define divisors, the quasi stability, and, um, and see what is the tropical curve. So we will do this now. Um, first, a divisor on a graph is a function that associates integer numbers to vertices in our graph. And the sum of this integer is the degree of this divisor. So here I have an example of a divisor of the degree five. And we needed the notion of pseudo divisor. Here, a pseudo divisor is a pair with a subset of edges 
in the graph and a divisor in the subdivided graph. Uh, I told you, uh, take the, the graph, take the divisor and choose a subset of edges. So I, I will add um, vertex in the interior of these edges. And I will give minus one for every exceptional vertex uh, in the subdivided graph. So this is an example of a pseudo divisor of degree minus two. Great. So now we can talk about quasi stability. So we take a polarization that is a function uh, which associate the rational numbers to the vertices in the graph. And the degree of this polarization is the sum of these rational numbers and is an integer number. And given a degree D divisor over the graph and a subset of vertices, we define it as invariant beta that help us to define the quasi-stability. So this invariant is the degree of the divisor over the subset of vertices minus the polarization over the subsets. I mean, the sum of the, the values of the polarization over the vertices in the, the set, uh, plus the cardinality of the, the set of edges connecting the subset V and its complementar over two, divided by two. So if we take a vertice, v, uh, a vertice of zero, and a polarization mu, a degree D divisor uh, on our graph is V0 mu quasi stable if this invariant is greater than or equal zero, zero for every proper subset. And this inequality is strict if V0 is in the subset V. An upset of divisor is um, V0 mu quasi stable if D is a V0 mu E quasi stable on uh, the subdivided graph. And here, this polarization is just an extension of the initial pol polarization uh, that we just put zero, um, associate zero to the, to the ex exceptional vertices. So uh, a quickly example uh, we could do for the, the banana curve. So if we look to this graph, and we try to calculate all the quasi-stable pseudo divisors of degree zero with the trivial polarization, all the, the values are zero, and considering V zero as this vertex. So we get these uh, pseudo divisors, unless permutation of the edges. So this, these pseudo divisors are related by specializations that I draw here. So I could, um, contract this edge to obtain this divisor or, or this edge to obtain this divisor. And I could do this again. And so we can relate it all the pseudo divisors via specializations. Great. So um, now we can define uh, what is a tropical curve. So now we need a metric graph that is a pair with a graph and a length function. So now I'm saying, uh, I'm putting lens in the edges of the graph and we choose an orientation and the tropical curve associated to the metric graph is the set of the union of the segments that uh, representing the edges with the vertices. But now I'm identifying the endpoints uh, of the edges with the vertices that touch the, the edge. And another thing that I have to observe here is that we will always consider uh, the length function constant and equal to one. So now we can see divisors on tropical curves. It's essentially the same thing that we saw for graphs, but now every point in the tropical curve is important, no just the vertices. So we needed to choose a finite subset of points in the tropical curve and associate the integer uh, numbers to this point. And the sum of these uh, integer are the degree of the divisor. A rational function on a tropical curve uh, is a continuous and piecewise linear function with integer slopes. And a principal divisor is a divisor associated to a rational function f.
And if we take two divisors uh, in the tropical curve, we say that they are equivalent if the subtraction of them are a uh, divisor associated to a rational function. And we talk about all these things because of this theorem. If we take a tropical curve and we choose a point in a degree depolarization, we can reorganize all the degree D divisors uh, associating them to uh, a unique equivalent uh, P0 mu quasi stable divisor. So this will help us to, um, to understand what the Jacobian is. So um, the Jacobian of um, a tropical curve with respect to a point P0 and a polarization mu is a polyhedral complex. And we have a set directly the composition here. So we have a union of polyhedron that parameterizes the P0 mu quasi stable divisors on X. And this polyhedron is just the product of the interior of the edges uh, in the, the subset E of the pseudo quasi, the pseudo <laughs> um, divisors. So we have to take the interior of the edges because now what we're doing in the case of tropical curves is uh, allow that this minus one walking through these edges. So that's the reason we need to take the interior. And then this is the, the, the face of the Jacobian of the, the, the tropical curve associated to the banana curve. So, and how did I get this, this draw? Um, I look at that set of pseudo divisors and the quasi stable pseudo divisors, and I relate the cells of dimension two with the common edges. So look that these two dimension two cells has uh, one edge in common that is exactly this minus one walking through the, the first edge. And these two, the minus one walking through the second edge, and these two, the minus one walking through the, the third edge. So um, we have these identifications, and more than this, we have another identifications. These cells of dimension one are identified, and these points that are cells of dimension zero are identified. So um, what is the tropical Abel map? So we, we have a tropical curve X and a divisor, the dagger, and the tropical Abel map is the product um, of the copies of X to the tropical Jacobian and take the top of points to the class of the divisor, the dagger minus the, the sum of these points. And the domain and codomain are polyhedral complex. We saw a picture that could show that the, the tropical Jacobian um, has a, is a polyhedral complex via quasi-stabilary conditions. And we will see uh, next that XD has a polyhedral uh, complex structure uh, by hypercubes. And this map is continuous, but in general, is not a map of polyhedral complex. I mean, not always uh, cells in XD go inside of cells in the tropical Jacobian. And to solve this, uh, guess what? We needed to subdivide cells here. So let's see the hypercubes in XD. Uh, I, we needed to take a function in the edges, that is just enumerate some subset of edges of our graph, and I can repeat some edge if I want. And we have um, a hypercube HF that is the product of these edges that I choose. And remember that my edges has length one. So we have a hypercube where the vertices of this hypercube um, are points that has the vertices of the graph as the entries. 
of these points. So not C2 that the this product of X can be present by the union of these hypercubes if we vary uh, the function F. So um, an example that we can see uh, again with the banana curve. So if we take the degree two of our map for um, the dagger, the uh, two times the this point, this vertex, and this is the V0 that we were considered before. And here we consider the, the, the trivial polarization. So if I choose the function F that takes E1 and E2, so we look the image of this square into the, the tropical Jacobian, we see that we have exactly this. So as you can see, this map is not a map of polyhedral complex because we have one cell goes in two cells of the, the Jacobian. And if I want to change this thing, uh, I just needed to subdivide this square uh, with this diagonal. So uh, this way I have the interior of these pieces goes into the interior of the, the cells in the Jacobian. So let's to um, glue all the things here, comparing the algebraic and the toric geometry. So we had a smoothing of another curve that could be related or associated to a dual graph. And here we have a tropical curve with a model and with unitary lengths. We had a line bundle L and here we have a uh, divisor, the dagger. We saw that CD is given locally by a toric variety associated to hypercube. And we saw too that XD is a union of hypercubes and our problems uh, was that the Abel map is a rational map and the tropical Abel map is not a map of polyhedral complex. And to solve this problem in the both case, we have to find refinements of hypercubes. So the better thing we can do now is relate these refinements. So what we, we do, we, we define um, a compatible triangulation, uh, a triangulation compatible with the Abel map, because the thing is, if we find um, a refinement of the hypercube in XD that um, make the map a uh, map of polyhedral complex, this refinement is exactly the refinement that helped me to extend the map. So we just have to, to connect this divisor, the dagger, with this line bundle. And we do this through the consider the dagger as the divisor of the degree key plus the uh, induced by the multi degree of this line bundle. And then we can see our main theorem. So uh, let pi be a regular smoothing of another curve C with smooth components A and X be the associated tropical curve. Consider the point N in X in CD where all the entries are nodes of another curve. And we take the hypercube HF where F is exactly the function that choose the the edges related to these nodes here. So the theorem says that a unimodular triangulation of the hypercube compatible with the drop color map give a local toric blow up beta such that the, the composite map beta with the, the table map is a morphism. So we can define uh, the table map everywhere. And so again, if we can find um, triangulation that make the Abel map um, a map of polyhedral complex, this uh, triangulation give us a local toric block that help us to extend the Abel map. 
And with this theorem, we were able to reprove that the degree one um, Abel map is, is defined everywhere. And the degree two, in the case that L is the structural sheaf and the polarization is the trivial, we can extend the map too. So now we have a lot of questions and problems to try to solve. The first one is um, here I ask for C um, has smooth components, but what happens if this is not, um, if, if I allow not be smooth components? So what happens if we have internal nodes? Can we extend our main theorem for existence of loops in our graphs? Or we can work with curves with two components and characterization of gonal curves via Abel maps <clears throat> or check the Abel map is always defined for curves of compacted type or even look at a degree D and for any curve um, can we extend this map or not focus on the degree but maybe the genus of the curve so we have a lot of questions to <clears throat> try to solve and this is the principal bibliography that we use it to make this. And thanks again. Thank you, Sally. Are there uh, questions for Sally? Well, I have a question. So, can you can you say anything about the? So, for, you mentioned the the fibers of the Abel map in the classical case. So, what is it in the in the case in the tropical world? So, uh, we believe that the the fibers it will be um, linear series too. But I didn't stood uh, this height, so I don't know many things about this, but we believe that it will have the same thing. We expect this. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Are there more questions? Well, if not, uh, let's thank Sally again. Thanks. And now let's, uh, maybe we may need one minute to to move to the next speaker so i um so let's uh, wait for the Cesar, can you share your screen uh, yes okay um can you see my screen it's yes soon it's, um, yes okay it appears so uh, now we have our second speaker of the young Bragg. And in fact, Cesar is not, Cesar Ilario is a, is a graduate student at IMPA. He's not Brazilian, but he's been working for his PhD here. And he will tell us today about Bertini's theorem in positive characteristic. Go ahead, Cesar. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me such a great opportunity to present my work. <clears throat> so let me start by setting up the context. So uh, let, uh, let me fix a uh, back the closed field K of characteristic P. And let's also fix a dominant morphism of reducible smooth algebraic varieties of over K, which I will denote by phi. Uh, we can see phi in terms of vibration. Vibrations, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, the fiber over each point of B, which is just its pre image, uh, is a closed sub variety of T. And um, T is, of course, the union of those uh, fibers. So T is a vibration. Uh, what Bertini's theorem says is that in characteristic zero, most of these fibers are smooth, but. Um, um, if since this holds in characteristic zero, we may ask 
for what happens in characteristic p greater than zero? And the answer is that the theorem fails. And to illustrate this fact, let me present a simple example. So let's consider this algebraic variety, which is defined as the zero locus of this polynomial in P2 cross A1. And we define our vibration just by projecting onto the second component. We can see what the fibers are. For any T in A1, the fiber is given by this algebraic curve, by this plane curve, and it has a singular point, which is T to the one over P01. And so we have a vibration by singular curves. So Bertini's theorem fails when the characteristic is greater than two. So uh, now let me describe uh, how I try to study this problem. I mean, my ultimate goal would be to try to classify these vibrations which are pathological. By pathological, I mean that Bertini's theorem fails. So, but this problem is too general to be handled. So, what I do is to make some assumptions, some reasonable assumptions. Actually, I take into account three hypotheses. The first one is that my vibration will be a vibration by algebraic curves, which means that almost all of the fibers will be algebraic curves. The second one is that the fibers should be integral, so uh, we should expect that each fiber should be irreducible. And the third one is that phi is proper. Uh, this happens, for example, when T is projective. So in particular, the fibers should be complete. And so what do these hypotheses mean for our vibration? Since the morphism is dominant, we do have uh, an inclusion of function fields. We just take an irrational function on B and we compose it with phi, and we obtain a rational function on T. So this gives a field extension. And the hypothesis we considered, I mean this hypothesis, mean that this field extension is finally generated, it is separable, and it has transcendence degree one. Moreover, the field KB, KB should be algebraically closed in KT. So in other words, this function field, I mean, this is a function field, uh, separable of dimension one. And uh, so this reminds us of the theory of algebraic curves, surely. And in fact, we can think of this function field as the function field of some algebraic curve C over this uh, field KB. And uh, we can actually give a very explicit description of its point. Uh, it has a generic point, and uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the closed points of C and the discrete relation rings of this function field. And in fact, the, the local rings of C are precisely these discrete relation rings, so in fact, C is a regular curve. We can state this in, in some fancy language, I mean, in the, fa in the language of the schemes. C is a geometrical integral, regular, complete, one-dimensional scheme of finite type over the spectrum of KB. Okay, so, so my point is that in order to study this vibration, what I can do is to study this curve appearing here. And why is that? Well, the reason is that when I look at this uh, map from the point of view of the scheme theory, I mean, if I, if I look at the corresponding morphism of the schemes, then C will be precisely the generic fiber of that uh, morphism. That's what I try to say here. So I take C as the corresponding morphism of the schemes. Then C will be the generic fiber of C. Okay, this curve is regular. And if the base extension of C to the algebraic closure of KB, which is called the geome geometric generic fiber of C, is an algebraic curve, which is integral over the, this base field, which is the algebraic closure of KB. Okay. And so let me define two important constants. Uh, so G will be the arithmetic genus of C. And this, uh, we, this will also be equal to the arithmetic genus of C bar. Well, this happens because uh, the arithmetic genus of curves are invariant under, under base field extensions. And let me denote by G bar the geometric genus of C bar. So the geometric genus of a curve cannot be larger than its arithmetic genus. So in general, we have that G bar is smaller than G. And we have a strict inequality if and only if C bar is singular. And in fact, the difference between these two numbers, I mean, G minus G bar, 
is equal to the sum of the singularity degrees of the points of this curve C bar appearing here. Uh, the singularity degree of a point is a non-negative number measuring how singular the point is. So it is zero if and only if the point is not singular. And the key point here is that this C bar is the general fiber of the vibration, which means that the, the properties of most of the fibers of phi are inherited from C bar. And so phi is a pathological vibration, which means that most of the fibers are singular, if and only if C bar is singular. And this happens if and only if uh, G bar is strictly smaller than G. So we have that uh, the fact that phi is pathological is related to the, our original vibration. And this inequality is related to this curve C here. So we're setting um, a link between these vibrations and this kind of curves, which are defined over a field which is not necessarily algebraically closed, which in this case is this field, uh, the, the function field of B, KB. So, so the reason I, uh, I am presenting this part is that I want to convince all of you <laughs> that in order to study this pathological vibration phi, it suffices to study the corresponding curve C. So why is that? The reason is that any two vibrations are birational equivalent, which means that there is a, um, a commutative square like this, where this is a birational map and this is also a birational map, if and only if the corresponding curves are isomorphic over this uh, base field. Well, both base fields coincide because we are assuming that these two varieties are isomorphic, no, are birational equivalent. And so we have that um, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these pathological vibrations by singular curves of arithmetic genus G and geometric genus G bar and the curve C with these parameters. Of course, I'm taking, I'm considering these vibrations up to birational equivalence, and here I am I'm considering the curves up to isomorphism. So um, what I do is to what I try to do is to focus on this part of this equivalent. I, I try to study these curves so that I can get some results about the, the, the original vibrations. And so let me give some historical data. Uh, there is a, a theorem by Tate which says that this genus drop, I mean the difference between these two genera, is a multiple of p minus 1 over 2. So uh, a pathological vibration may exist only if p minus 1 over 2 is a multiple, I mean it is smaller than g minus g bar, so in particular p should be smaller than 2g plus 1. Uh, so when g is equal to 1, these vibrations have already been studied by the others appearing here. I mean, Queen, Burgess, Net, Ustor, and Simara Cagnette. And when g is equal to 3, there are four possibilities to be considered for p. I mean, p may be equal to 2, 3, 5, or 7. And all these cases have been considered, uh, except the case p equals 2. And that's the case I want to focus on now. Uh, so, are there any examples of uh, vibrations by singular curves of arithmetic genus 3 in characteristic 2? And if there, if there are any examples, what can we say about them? Can we classify them? And actually, there are examples. Here's one example. So, we take uh, our curve C to be the, the, the curve defined by this polynomial over some field K, which is not necessarily algebraically closed. Actually, it should not be algebraically closed, where T is an element of K, which is not a square. Its parameters are precisely G equals 3 and G bar equals 0. Uh, I should mention that this uh, field K should be thought of as the function field of, uh, of the vibration. What do I mean by this? It should be thought of as this function field, KB, okay? And uh, so we have this example. So what can we say about the vibration associated to this example? To see this, I define this algebraic variety, which is uh, whose equation is just obtained by homogenizing this equation with respect to T. So we, we define this uh, surface inside P2 cross P1. It is not uh, a smooth surface. It has just one singular point. And we take as our vibration just the projection onto the second component. We can see what the fibers are very explicitly. 
I mean the, fi the fiber over a finite point of P1, which is a point of the form 1T is given by this polynomial equation. So this fiber is a rational plane projective quartic. It has arithmetic genus 3 and geometric genus 0. And it has a unique singular point, which is written down here, of singularity degree 3. Okay. So this happens for all the finite fibers of this vibration. But if we look at the infinite point of P1, which is 0, 1, then we get a fiber which is degenerate. I mean, it is given by this polynomial z to the 4. And, and so somehow this fiber is bad. But we do get a pathological vibration because most of the fibers, I mean this, the, the fibers over the finite points of P1 are singular, okay? And uh, actually, there's another way to see this example. I mean, S uh, is given by this equation and it has this singular point and it ha S has two, two projection maps. One is uh, the onto the second projection one, which is our original vibration fee. And the other is onto, uh, is down to a, uh, P2. So it turns out that H is birational. It's a birational map, so it has an inverse. And by composing a phi with that inverse, we get a, a rational map from P2 to P1, which is given by this assignment here. And, uh, and so, in fact, our vibration is a pencil of plane quartics because the fibers of this map are precisely the members of this pencil of quartics. So this is just another way of seeing our example what we have so far and we observe that this rational map is not defined at this point zero one zero so it so the linear system has one base point which lies below this singular point of s okay now let me present another example uh, this well the first example was uh, has the parameter g bar equals to zero but there are examples with g bar equals to one so let's see b the plane uh, quartic defined by this equation, where t is a, a, a constant, which is not, not a square. And uh, this curve has parameters g equals 3 and g bar equals 1. And so, and how does it look like in terms of vibrations? To see that, we define this algebraic variety. We do the same as in the previous example. We just uh, take t to be an, 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 a transcendent element over our base field k. This case, this base field K is, is original, is our original base field we defined. I mean the the algebraic equation field K from the first slide, and so um, this is a singular surface. It has, uh, no, it is not a surface. I think it's a surface, and it has one singular point. And uh, as our vibration, we take the projection onto the second component again. We can see what the fibers are. They are given by these uh, polynomials in P2. So we have a vibration by plane cortex, each of which has one singular point. I mean, this is the singular point. And moreover, each uh, fiber has arithmetic genus 3 and geometric genus 1. So we get a vibration by singular curves of arithmetic genus 3 and geometric genus 1, such that each fiber has um, um, one singular point. And moreover, since the geometric genus of ST is equal to 1, this means that it is geometrically elliptic. So its non-singular model is an elliptic curve. So we can compute its J-invariant. And it turns out that the J-invariant is exactly T to the 1 half. So this is, this is quite interesting because um, the J-invariant of the curve uh, depends on the value of the base. So as the... As the, as the point in the base moves, then the J-invariant of the fiber will also move according to the values of T. So this is uh, interesting. So um, before going further, let me point out that uh, there are lots of examples of this uh, kind of vibrations. I mean, here, the example here has just one singular point, but there are examples when G is equal g is equal to 3 and g bar is equal to 1, such that each fiber has two singular points. And there are examples with g bar equals to 0. Uh, I mean, there are vibrations by singular curves of arithmetic genus 3 and geometric genus 0, such that each fiber has three singular points. In the example we presented here, 
Let me go back. In the example we presented here, each fiber has just one singular point, but there are examples with three singular points. Okay, so there are lots of examples and I am not presenting them all. So let me state the main result, my main result. So we consider any curve C, which satisfy the hypothesis uh, I have been considering um, in characteristic two. So this curve C has the parameters G equals three and G bar equals one, plus some extra conditions. This, this is a, some technical condition. And I don't know if I will have time to explain that, but the, the thing is that C has parameters G equals three and G bar equals one plus some extra conditions. If and only if C is isomorphic to one of the following projective curves, this one, uh, this curve, which is given by the intersection of a surface and a hypersurface, which depends on the param on some constants, okay? And there's a second family, which is given by the intersection of, as the intersection of, of some threefold and three hypersurfaces, which are cut out by these equations. And we also have uh, some parameters here, which are the constants. And so, the important thing is that we do have a characterization of these curves. We know how they look like. Um, and more than that, we know we can determine the isomorphism classes because in order to get a birational classification of vibrations, we have to determine uh, uh, isomorphism classes of the corresponding curves. So we can say when any of these two families of curves are isomorphic, I, I mean, I. I can say when any two members of these families of curves are isomorphic. Actually, uh, this happens. If we take any two curves, C and C prime from item one with these parameters, let me go back. Uh, each, uh, each curve depends on these parameters here, which are constants. Then, so if we take any two, two such curves with these parameters, then they are isomorphic if and only if there exists some constants satisfying some linear, some system of equations. And so, um, okay, this looks rather involved and it is actually. And for the second item, the same happens. And, uh, but the important thing is that we do have a classification of uh, this kind of curve satisfying these requirements. Now, in order to finish the talk, I would like to present an interesting phenomena arising in the first example I presented. I mean, this was the example. It was for geometric genus zero. So we, uh, we had this surface, which is singular. It, this is its singular point. And our vibration was just the projection onto the second component. No, yeah, onto the second component, we had this rational map. So our vibration was, is a pencil of plane cortex. And we may wonder, well, we know that S is, uh, is singular and we may wonder what can we do to, to get uh, a surface which is smooth so that, we so that the total space of our vibration could be um, smooth. So what we can do is to blow up S at this point, at the singular point. No, this is not the point, at this point, at the singular point, and we get a new vibration. I mean, we will get, first of all, a smooth projected surface, then a birational morphism from S tilde to S, and we compose it with our original vibration to get a new vibration. And if you remember, uh, if you remember the fibers of phi over the finite points of P1 were nice. I mean, they were plain cortex. Um, singular and the fiber over the infinite point was defined by 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 a polynomial by the polynomial z to the four so it was degenerate so in fact the fibers of phi and the fibers of f over the finite points of p1 are the same i mean they are isomorphic but the fiber but we, we can try to see what the fiber of f over the infin the point at infinity of p1 is how, how does it look like and um, Actually, we can see that this exceptional fiber, it is exceptional because uh, it is a union of uh, rational curves according to this, uh, whose configuration is giving 
by this Dinkin diagram. Uh, so, and, and we can describe very explicitly what the geometry of this exceptional fiber is, because uh, we know what the intersection, the, the self-intersection numbers of these uh, curves are. And uh, moreover, uh, so, so we notice that there are no minus one curves in these uh, exceptional fibers. So, so the point is that we cannot blow down this, uh, this uh, surface S tilde at, uh, at any uh, prime divisor of this exceptional fiber to get us a, a surface which is more simple. So this, this is just to say that, in fact, this F is the minimal, is the regular proper, is the minimal regular proper model of our original vibration, which means that there are no minus one curves in the exceptional fiber. And so uh, we get the, um, that interesting fact. And, but uh, we may wonder what happens if we try to find a minimal model for S tilde, because, well, there are no minus one curves in this exceptional fiber, but, but, but there may be uh, minus one curves outside that exceptional fiber. And it turns out that this point here, which, is, which does not belong to the exceptional fiber, represents a curve which is minus one. And uh, if we blow down this curve, then this, um, this curve which ha will have self-intersection minus one then this curve will have self-intersection minus one if we blow down this, the, 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 this curve. And so we will end up blowing down all these curves here, except the one that is here, which is Z. And so my point is that we can show that S tilde has a minimal model, which is isomorphic to P2. And in order to see this, there is another way, which is interesting. And, and which corresponds to what I wrote here. Uh, actually, we can try to uh, blow up the base point of tau of the base uh, of the pencil of plane cortex, and we will obtain a surface S bar with this exceptional fiber. And as you can see, these two Dinkin diagrams are very similar. And in fact, what happens is that S bar is isomorphic to S tilde. And uh, under this isomorphism, the two diagrams correspond. And so we see, for, for instance, that E1 does not appear in the, in the exceptional fiber of F here, and Z does not appear in the exceptional fiber of uh, S bar. Uh, but what we can see is that E1 has self-intersection minus one. And if we blow down all these curves, then we will end up by blowing down all the exceptional fiber of S bar. Okay, so we will end up by, by obtaining just P2. So we blow down the exceptional fiber and we obtain P2. And since these two surfaces are isomorphic, then we obtain that the minimal model of P of uh, S tilde is equal to P2. Okay, this is uh, stated here in, in the theorem, okay? And well, this was just to, exp to, to give a, a flavor of what we can obtain from this uh, very pathological phenomenon. So let me stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Cesar. Are there questions or comments for Cesar? So I think we have a question. Let me read it from the chat. Uh, Israel is asking, do you know the dimension of the orbits of the examples of Portix? Uh, they have dimension one because they are curves. Uh, which example? The first so the one, one from the, the one from the cortex. I think he wants to know the dimension of the of the orbits. Yeah, you know, the orbit under the PGL PGL three. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting the question. 
so the question so you have the action of the, the the action of the pgl3 over which space of those i think those singular cortex uh, i'm not sure um I guess I, I don't, there is no action, I, I guess, if I am not mistaken. <laughs> uh, PGL3 acts on, on, on the space of fibers, is that what, what he says? Uh, it acts on P2, so it acts in the, uh, in the system of curves. In your example, is a pencil, right? So, yeah, so we have the pencil of cortex, okay? Yeah, so take, take for instance, the general member of the pencil. It's a yeah. cortex. Okay. So, uh, there is an associated orbit uh, or for this cortex. Uh, okay. mm. I, I, I haven't mean, really, I haven't really thought about it. I think it's interesting, but uh, I don't know because I haven't thought about it yet. Well, it's just a curiosity. I mean, uh, okay. The moment the moment you come with something which is sort of strange, I'd like to know how big it is. Ah, okay. Okay. Up to change of coordinates in, uh, in P2. Up to a change of coordinates in P2. Mm. No, I, I'm not sure about it. I, I mean, I... I have no answer. <laughs> Cesar, let me ask you something. So all, in all these examples, the base of the vibration was always P1, right? Yeah, but, but for so instance... So is it, is it clear that you can always find that whenever you have a, such a pathological uh, example, it can be realized as a vibration over P1? No, for, for instance, in the... In this result, uh -huh. um, the parameters we have here, which is, which are a zero, a two, a four, a six, and a eight, will play the role of uh, the transcendence in our mm -hmm. in our vibration. So what we will get is a vibration over a five. Ah, okay. So in this case, we get a vibration over a space of higher dimension. So the base. The, the the total space will have dimension six, mm -hmm. but all these things uh, we did for surfaces cannot be done for higher dimensional spaces. Mm -hmm. Clearly. Okay, thank you. So, are there more questions? So, if not, uh, let's thank Cesar. Again. So I thank you all for the participation, and in particular, I thank uh, Sally and Cesar for the very nice talks. And so we will see each other again uh, next week. Uh, we will investigate whether we will be able to continue with uh, Google Meet or if we have to move to Zoom but you will um you will learn about that in